The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the hosts and guests as individuals, and do not necessarily reflect those of advertisers or sponsors. This show is intended as entertainment and commentary only. The producers strive for verisimilitude, but nothing said on this podcast should be taken as fact by the listener or viewer without performing due diligence. The existence, the physical universe, is basically playful. There is no necessity for it whatsoever. It isn't going anywhere. That is to say, it doesn't have some destination that it ought to arrive at. This is Keep Your Hat On, a show by three nerdy nobodies about nothing in particular. Keep Your Hat On is brought to you by the Narrow Band Broadcast Network and BBN, the focus is on you by podsquadpdx.com painless podcasting and by the kind support of kyho fans everywhere through patreon patreon create on your own terms on this episode chris insists a giant chrome bunny is art dr mark insists that even howlies get the blues we watch two of our stalwart explorers get stabbed can't wait for that Maybe they'll finally let me out of this Faustian deal. Anyway, I'm your disembodied announcer, Michael Brumage, and now let's get whatever the hell this is started. Here's the crew, Andrew, Robert, Dr. Mark, and Chris. Hello, and welcome to Keep Your Hat on the Show, where, hell, even we don't know where we're going to go. I'm Andrew Scott, along with my good friends Robert Anthony and Dr. Mark Peterson out in Wisconsin, and my partner Chris Vacano. And Chris, what do you got for us today? I hear it has to do something about the fact that you don't know art. All right, Chris, let's go to school. What do you got? All right, so uh, I wanted to actually kick this off with an artist who... I've had a long-standing love-hate relationship with, and I've come to really appreciate in doing the research for this segment. And as I as I sort of started going down this rabbit hole, uh, it, it sort of got bigger to include another artist that I could draw parallels and analogies to, and then put them into a larger framework and context. And actually, uh, so 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 the artist I started off with, uh, his name is Jeff Koons. Uh, he started his career in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, he's done. He's known for having done several several series of different work. Um, he's he's very well known in the art world. Not so well known, you know, outside of kind of the the academic elite gallery, ivory tower of the art world. Right. Uh, but but he's he's something of a bad boy in the art world and was very much anchored in as uh, one of the one of the prime um, vanguard of the postmodernist movement in art. And so that's that's the broader context. And I think that uh, that's probably what people uh, your your everyday man or, or woman or, or person uh, who looks at art is probably going to know him best for. I mean, the thing that I know him for mostly is his recent piece rabbit right and i'll Uh, i'll come back around to that uh that's that's kind of where i'm going to kind of circle back around towards the end mm -hmm. um the uh, let me uh, let me talk for a moment about what postmodernism is because it's it's kind of poorly understood uh oftentimes it's confused with the postmodern philosophical movement which yes the the artists were all reading uh, Roland Berta and Jacques Derrida and so on, um, but but that wasn't really the driving force in in the postmodern movement. Uh, the The driving force was that postmodernism was a reactionary, rebellious movement against the the precepts that were set out in modernism, which which was this encapsulation of this idea that. Art should be forward thinking. It should be forward building. Um, it it should be establishing. It, it should be looking towards the future and be out ahead of culture. And and the postmoderns 
basically sought to knock art off of its pedestal, uh, basically smash all the pieces and put them back together in, in a very different way, in very different combinations. Can you give uh, people who are listening and watching an idea of time frame of when postmodern, as far as art goes, really started gaining traction in American culture and around the world? Yeah, the uh, postmodernism, uh, its its early days started in the 60s, you know, early to mid 60s. Uh, it really caught steam in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, and really around by, by about 2000 or the early aughts, uh, it, it was pretty much done. Um, now, so was always of that movement, wasn't he? Yeah, I I mark Warhol as very much the tip of the spear. In yeah, that I movement. would I would say he was a man. Um, he was a later manifestation of it uh, from the fifties, uh, contemporized into the sixties, and yeah. then really started setting his own tone. Right. It, it it was where Warhol pivoted and started working with his his sort of pop culture prints. That's uh, 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 he. He was so influential on so many artists, particularly those in in New York City, uh, mm -hmm. that 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 they were they were very much acolytes of his movement, and that really gave rise to the postmodern thing, uh, where sort of the philosophy in postmodernism, you know, in reacting to modernism, was was not only just breaking apart all the pieces and being iconoclastic and and you know, changing the rules. They they also really focused on the merging of high art and low art and and changing the vernacular of art, changing the language and, and the way we use it. And Jeff Koons is a great example of this mm -hmm. um, because what he's essentially done, um, I, I mean, you look at Jeff Koons' work and at first blush and 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 i wrestled with this for a long time when i first got exposed to jeff coons back in the 90s uh at first blush you kind of shrug and look at his work or mm -hmm. or you're, you're actually appalled by it and, and and i was very much appalled by it I, I i was i was looking at his work saying good god people are paying these ridiculous amounts of money and i'm having to study this idiot and 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 what I learned as I started to dig in is that was that was kind of exactly his point was was that uh, banal everyday objects and kitsch and high polish, uh, you know, these things were interesting. You know that 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 why not elevate the banal and the mundane, and and think about it you know recontextualize it and rethink it and recognize that 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 art exists in our every day well what's um, interesting to me too is in that time frame when when coons was really starting to get more prominence in the late 70s and early 80s um design was going through a renaissance itself where things that were made for daily use were we were re-examining things like ergonomics we were re-examining things like uh form and function and that mm -hmm. you know even things that are 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 obvious and basic as far as the utility actually deserve to be looked at as art from their physical design properties Absolutely. And, and this was one of the interesting things in the postmodern movement was that was uh, this massive collision of high art and design and low art. And, mm -hmm. and, and the design piece really comes in in that a lot of postmodern artists used a uh, sort of technique uh, for, for lack of a better word, I can't find a better word. Um, uh called bricolage which oh, is yeah. the the introduction of text into art pieces that that was a very new thing you know bringing the written word into painting into sculpture into photography uh this this was a this was a new thing and they had they they were really shattering a barrier and a boundary 
that had been very carefully and meticulously minded by artists leading up to that point. Um, and and yes, you're absolutely right. This 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 notion of design coming in, the notion of manufacture and and just just the presence of everyday objects. I want to circle us back to Jeff Koons and the earliest pieces that I I encountered were um, Michael Jackson with Bubbles the Chimp, which actually got a lot of press coverage uh, at mm -hmm. the time. Um, <laughs> And 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 you look at this piece, and it it's hideous. I mean, it is it is kitsch. It is appalling. Yeah. I mean, it's is that just the one that's gold. It's yes. all done in like gold and stuff. Gold and yeah. white and horrible. It's 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 literally. I, I mean, it creates a very visceral vomit response when you consider that it's being shown <laughs> in the highest prestige places in the art world, but. It's it's also fascinating in that regard because it, you know essentially Jeff Koons is knocking down the doors and saying, you know, kitsch, highly painted, gold, you know, gold, shiny, uh, ceramic, uh, ceramic uh, sculpture of a massive pop culture icon it belongs in these hallowed spaces. And, and, and that shook a lot of people up. That shook a lot of thinking up. Um, the yeah, other, so he's, oh, go ahead. Punk rock. He's just like punk rock of art world. <laughs> Absolutely. You bet. Quite, you bet. Yeah, and, quite and, so. And there's, there's the analogy. And, and, and postmodernism <laughs> in general is very much punk rock in the sense of if, if you take modernism as being classic rock and being very serious and very earnest and very, you know, devoted to a vision and a mission, uh, you know, the postmoderns came in and said, hell with that. I've got three chords, a guitar and the truth, you know, yep. and they really sought to, you know, change the thinking. Um, the, the other, the other early pieces were that, that I encountered were from his made in heaven series, which it takes, it takes the artist into, I mean, Jeff Koons took himself and his marriage to, uh, at the time, a uh, well-known Italian porn actress named Cicolina. Yeah. Uh, That's Albert. actually where I first know him from was Cicolina. No, they're, and, they yeah, divorced years ago. Yeah, they, oh. they, yeah but I, I remember hearing about them because as a young man, I was an aficionado of certain magazines that shall remain nameless. <laughs> And of course, they were all they were all falling over themselves when Cicolina wound up being elected to uh, to Italian Parliament. Right, right, and 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 that I, I mean they they were doing some fascinating things in the eighties and nineties. I mean they 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 were sort of the embodiment of of culture really looking at itself. Well, and the, the and... interesting thing to me too is now that I'm looking at it with fifty some year old eyes, I can actually see that. Um, Cicolina being in Italian Parliament is, in and of itself, very postmodern. Deliberately. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, completely. Yeah. That was not an accident. Absolutely. Um, and 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 so and 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 this this gets into one of the other really big components of postmodernism, and and this is where I'm going to transition to this third artist creator that I mentioned. Uh, but but the postmoderns really introduced and and. Actually, I shouldn't say introduced because there were some artists who were doing this prior to the postmoderns. But they really championed. They really championed and really codified and cemented the idea of art being self-aware mm. and, and, and really examining what is art, what constitutes art, what, uh, you know, what uh, they, they, they started actually making art that was intentionally art rather than art serving some other higher purpose. Right. Uh, and, and, and often commenting on art that had gone before, uh, through the use of, uh, you know, recon recontextualization, um, you know, uh, so where do appropriation, you appropriation, things where, like that. Where do you see, Coons's influence then in today, and by the way, for those who don't know, 
Um, Jeff Koons is still a working artist. I believe he's 60. Oh. Five sixty-six, somewhere's around there, yep. something like that. And and uh, he is, st- he yeah, is he's still, still a going. Today. He's a going concern in the art world, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, he's primarily sculpture based. I've seen some flat work of his in the past, but mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, again, really the 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 biggest piece of Kuhn's art that is in the public consciousness is his uh, piece Rabbit, which I believe the Rabbit, which I believe and- is still holds the record. It's it's one of two pieces he's done that hold the, uh, that are in the Guinness Book of World's Records for highest sale at uh, highest sale price at yeah. auction. Yeah, highest sale at auction, and I believe it went uh, ninety one point one million dollars back in two thousand nineteen. Rabbit sold for, Good. and Rabbit. Hey. It just for those of us who are uh, listening uh, on the audio side of the podcast, if you're not familiar, uh, Rabbit is a nineteen eighty six piece, and if you ever saw. A classic balloon rabbit made by a balloon artist. It looks for all the world like that, made out of a kind of a platinum looking foil. It is mm-hmm. well, that's that's the is, surface treatment. It's, yes, it's it, yeah, it's it's sculpted in metal, and then and then he wanted to get this very smooth, very high finish surface on it. And and what it, it was coming across rabbit when I started to really appreciate Jeff Coons mm-hmm. and, and I stopped being angry and hostile to were, him. Were you, <laughs> were you won over, were you won over by the, by the, um, the juxtapositions or were you won over by the process or what really kind of kicked it over from one side to the other for you? It, it was, it was a combination of things for me personally. I had fully kind of absorbed at that point what postmodernism was doing and what it was about. And so it made sense to me. I understood the rules of the road. I could fit it in. Um, The simplicity and the elegance of the piece and the recognition of, yes, it's, it's a balloon rabbit, but it's also a beautiful combination of forms and, and his surface treatment, making it pristine and highly polished as you say, the juxtapositions and the fact that it's made out of metal and it's gigantic. But at a distance, it looks like what you would think if somebody says balloon rabbit. I mean, yeah. you, you could easily, at a distance, mistake it for something that somebody was handing a child. Right, right, absolutely. Now, how do you tie this into your your final uh, destination with where Coons is as far as our our culture right. and our, our art consciousness goes. So, so to give an analogy, and this, this is where we bring in this third creator. Uh, I, I had this revelation uh, in, the, in the last couple of weeks that inspired me to actually pick up, you, you know, to really work with this particular topic for this particular segment. And that's the films of Baz Luhrmann ah. uh, working in, 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 in film, in cinema, Buzz Lerman, roughly contemporary to Jeff Koons. He's a bit younger. He's 58 now. Mm-hmm. His, 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 I see striking similarities in, in their work. So, so for people who might not be so familiar with Jeff Koons, Jeff Koons is kind of the Buzz Lerman of the art world, in my opinion. Now, uh, uh, due diligence, you need to start. <laughs> let's give uh, a, a bit of a yeah, breakdown of some, some of the things that that Boz has done gonna, in the past. I was going to lay out why. Oh. Um, so, so, so Boz Lerman, he, he, he works not just strictly in cinema, but that's kind of my focal area for this, for this piece. He's also done commercial advertising. He's uh, done, uh, you know, recordings, a television. He works in a lot of different media with regard to his filmmaking uh i'll just run down the quick list there's the red curtain trilogy which starts with strictly ballroom moves on to romeo and juliet uh oh that's right he did he did the he did the 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 leo's romeo and juliet the the leonardo dicaprio which actually i thought was a really underrated version of romeo and juliet i thought that that was actually extraordinarily well done well, and, and uh, yeah, the response to that film depends very much on the lenses through which you view it. Yes. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and the third in the, in, in the Red Curtain trilogy is uh, 
perhaps his best known film, Moulin which is Moulin Rouge. Moulin Rouge. That yep. was, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm unabashedly a fan of that film. Oh, yeah, it was terrific. But you can also see, I was just thinking of this too, is like you can see the shiny surfaces and that same kind of color palette Oh yeah, right, that Coons uses all the time too, right? Well, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, and, like and, hyper technicolor. And it was actually Moulin Rouge that triggered the connection for me because uh -huh. I found I had the same visceral disgust the first time I saw that movie. The same oh. visceral, uh, I was appalled by it. I, I, and and that's because I was looking through lenses of cinema is supposed to be a certain way right and and that and that it, movie right there was a reintroduction to a style of visual storytelling and i'm not even talking about uh the no. the, the set i'm talking about the use of colors that was a, a recelebration of garishness which i think also does hold hands very well with the postmodern aesthetic the idea yeah. that sometimes color can be subtle but it's also okay for 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 color to actually assault you and yes. make you me be more aware and at times make you feel uncomfortable and moulin right. rouge does that it 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 gives you that sense of discomfort sometimes with its colors because it is so deep and so vibrant and so garish that mm -hmm. you immediately have a visceral reaction to it right right I and, also and, liked his treatment of, of Gatsby. Right. Yes, the Greg Gatsby was. Uh, and was you know what? I got to I got to cop to something. I have not seen that. I probably mm. should. I probably should see that version of Gatsby, seeing that I've seen every other version of Gatsby pretty much ever done. Right. So it was a good place to bring the garish because that sort of was the idea. Right? Well, yeah, that's 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 what right. the whole story is is garishness yeah. in both word and then when you translate it into the visual. Yeah, right. right. It's 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 this sort of excessiveness and 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 a particular you know, American embracement of the garish and the god. Yes, yes. And and so how I'd like to tie this back together is is. To you know, let's take a look for a moment at Moulin Rouge and one of the most memorable scenes, the theater scene. Oh yeah, where they're doing "Smells Like Teen Spirit" and you've got men in top hats and tails, you know, singing "Smells Like Teen Spirit" interspersed with, you know, the 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 showmaster, you know, doing doing his bits and this big, huge, lavish Bollywood-looking dance production i think bollywood uh, is a really good descriptor it really does yeah. smack of bollywood yeah uh and 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 you know i i there's no doubt in my mind that lerman was drawing that influence intentionally sure um yeah you because, don't you sure don't do it by accident because because this is what postmodernism is all about is throw a bunch of different things into a blender and see what you come out with you know, the one thing I want to ask you, Chris, as we wrap this portion up, and this is something that I've, I embrace postmodernism, but at the same time, there are, there are times where I tread very gently. And that is, and I'll be interested to hear from Mark and Robert on this as well. <clears throat> postmodernism at times tends to teeter on that line of appropriation. And I was, gr mm -hmm. I was, I was glad that you mm -hmm. brought in the Bollywood angle, um, because I don't think that that was appropriation there, but I think that there are times where postmodernism is so confident in itself and so willing to break boundaries that at times it maybe can cross over and appropriate. Now, oh, obviously, oh, you, you can't. Appropriation was a blatant strategy being used by a number of postmodern artists. Yeah, interesting. So you think that that was part of the 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 informed art view of the maker that I'm going to appropriate this and use that appropriation as a way to point to appropriation, or am I doing it oh. because I feel I have such artistic license? Uh, it's more of the latter. And, and actually the point that was informing most of these artists that they kept trying to hammer home was that everything in art that could be done has been done. There is nothing, uh, basically, there is the nothing battle new. cry, yeah, there the is battle nothing cry new. was painting is dead. Right. And, uh, and, and 
so they, uh, uh, you know, my my speculation is that they felt very much um, the responsibility for for shaping something new and and in part of that reaching back to the old to bring it back forward uh that, but, that but reminds me of what it. that reminds me i believe nobody can quote me on this until i put it in the the show notes but um i believe it was roy Lichtenstein who actually said i don't need to worry about offending anybody because everything is already offensive <laughs> It's a um, great quote. Uh, but yep. uh, yeah, let's let's button this up. Where do you think, if a person is really interested in looking at Coons and starting to do a little bit of a dive into him, where where do you suggest that that people head? Oh, I, well, he's he's got a website. That's a that's a great place to start. Uh, JeffCoons dot com. There you go. Uh, Easy to remember. Rolls off the tongue. Uh, yeah, I would also you know I would also check out uh, the Whitney Museum. Uh, website mm -hmm. uh, because they've been sort of one of the uh, one of the strongest advocates and patrons for Jeff Koons. They they took a lot of risks showing his work, and and uh, the Whitney the Whitney is known widely as being a very sort of progressive and forward thinking gallery in the art world. They're willing to try things that other more traditional galleries are afraid to touch. Uh, you know, they they also broke through for other postmoderns like Damien Hirst and some of the others who we'll talk about on on another show because I love talking about Damien Hirst. Well, all um, I were, all I really want us to do is to get to the point where we talk about a banana taped to the wall. We'll be right back after this message. I don't know what the hell the message is. I haven't created it yet, but this is Keep Your Hat On. I'm Andrew. That's Mark. That's Robert. That's Chris. We'll be right back. Chris and Andy do a thing. All right, everybody. We are here to get stabbed. Woo -hoo. It is the day. Freedom day. Put it in my arm. Right? Give me the juice. Yep. And we got our card. And it is a beautiful day. And everybody is waving at us because it is the day of all days. It, you know, people are giving us thumbs up. You can tell they're smiling behind their masks. I've never seen a happier bunch of workers. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's very cool that they're being so supportive and encouraging. And, and you know, and the, the process here, you know, they got, the process they got here is really smooth and well designed. Yeah, I, I agree entirely. And, uh, yeah, just uh, for anybody who doesn't know, we are down at the Portland Airport, or PDX at the red lot which is the normal uh overflow lot and you should give a tip of the hat to oshu oshu Oregon health today. science university yep and, rock stars and they're doing our they're doing our steps we're headed for the tent right now so we got to shut off because we got people that we can't film but then once we're past them we can so we'll be right back and we has checked in and they even gave us permission to film so we are we are going live with the juice, except for not really live. We're gonna be, you know, showing this to you later. Thank you. And definitely making sure to give them a nice target area right in the tree of life. Yep. Mm. Okay. Oh, just straight out like that? Okay. Excellent. Okay. Yep. <laughs> I'm trying to give you a good target. Come on. <laughs> 
Still. Wait, you're done? done? That's almost disappointing. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thank you so much. You're thank you for all you've been doing. Uh, oh, guys. thank you. Yep, yep. But otherwise, people do great. Excellent. Once you get yours, then you guys will have a 15 minute line, okay? Sounds good. Right on. Yep, we know the process. Thanks. Super. Yep, and this is me getting my stab. <laughs> Won't even make a joke. Did you all see that? <laughs> Did you see how easy that was? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> oh, you can tell we're at the airport. <laughs> but yeah, seriously, I've had I've had more pain from stubbing my toe. I don't know if you can make that out from over there, but past that yellow vest is my hood looking out at us. In all her glory. Yeah, now we're now we're we just arrived at the 15 minute waiting line. Yep, so we just sit here and chill for 15 minutes. Yeah. And we just feel the freedom in our veins or our muscles or yep. whatevs. Yep. 15 minutes. 15 minutes to glory. And that, my friends, as they say, is that we got it in us. We got the juice in us. We are on the road. So whatever the hell comes next. Well, to uh, another. To another well, yeah, point, yeah, in a month. But uh, do everybody a favor, including yourself. Get the damn shot. People are beeping in joy. <laughs> the the people at the lot were hooting in happiness. Yeah, and, and and I saw actually, you know some of the workers were clapping for people as yeah. as we were leaving. Right. I mean, it's like that. That's that's what this is about. This is about everybody doing their part and helping us get back yep. to whatever and get through to the next thing. And, so and, and get your shots. It's, it's not a big deal. Yep. No. Because science. And welcome back. This is the last chapter of this episode of Keep Your Hat On. I'm Andrew Scott, along with my good friends Chris Vacano and Robert Anderson. And our special contributor, who you're probably going to be seeing here off and on, mostly on, uh, Dr. Mark Peterson, professor of philosophy in the University of Wisconsin. And uh, Mark, um, you know, you and I how were... Much, how many, how many, where did you get down to, Mark? 7,417. Oh, that's the total. Okay, 7,417 uh, licks to get to the center research. of a Tootsie Pop. Suck on that, Owl. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah, well, we, 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 we have no sacred cows here. This is, this is the podcast where all cows are black. That's a philosophy joke for you. Wow, uh, that is an inside joke. <laughs> it's very way. inside. It's so inside. You have to lick through about 30 in order to get wow, to the center least, of that one. Yeah, that's I'll right. keep coming at it. I'll keep coming with it. Um, but uh, Mark and I were talking earlier. Uh, Mark and I have known each other now for 30 plus years. He was my, uh, he was my mentor and my, uh, my primary philosophy instructor wow. uh, before I went off to bigger and smaller things at a different college for a little while before I finally punched the cord, bailed out, and became a web developer, which brought me to the West Coast. And here I am. But, that um, was my fallback position, by the way. Uh, what, web developer? Um, computer science. Okay. Yeah. yeah well, that's the other thing that Mark and I, that's the other thing that Mark and I share is we have a, a deep and abiding fondness for, um, useless old Unix. computers. Yeah. Useless old computers. <laughs> uh, you know, um, K pros, K pros, awesome uh, machines, uh, uh, awesome machine. The uh, first time I ever propped that up on my legs and felt that 28 pounds cutting into my <laughs> knees and going, this is the future. The future is here. Oh, and, um, good days. Good and, and, time, and, man. and of course the ultimate, the ultimate text base arcade game ladder, which oh. I still, you know, you can play that online. You can play that on the web. Somebody has come up with right. a ladder clone and it, I was just, 
if we're going to revisit those days, I was an Adventure 550 uh, freak oh, yeah. in those days. All yeah, space. boy. You're in, a, yeah. you're in a maze of twisty passages all alike. That was a good time sitting um, there playing that in the dark. Yeah, that was all right. And nothing but mm-hmm. nothing but the green screen CRT bathing your eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that you was the, that was the that was the Matrix before the Matrix was the Matrix. As soon as I saw the CRT colors of the Matrix, I was like, I'm home. Uh, I know where that me, is. You've yeah. got me desperately trying to remember the game that we used to play in the computer lab in my high school, which was uh, text based. Uh, there basically, was a soundtrack. Yeah, well, this was this There's was a Wampus. precursor. Uh, this is a precursor to Doom, where you were put on a map, oh. and the whole point was to actually get run around the map and deathmatch with with each other. You would you would hunt <laughs> each other down. Uh, it was a wow. network game. Oh damn! And, see, you were that was light years ahead of me. Network yeah, game. Years later. Years yeah. later. I mean, I started out with a hundred and a hundred and fifty baud modem that literally was handset. And, um, the first time, the first time my dad and I got a hard drive to put in that K pro, it was 10 megabytes 10 big megs, and we were like, what the what hell are, are we going to do with all this? Nobody knew. Yeah. No, the but yeah. 10. And, uh, and turbo, I, I, turbo I Pascal, what... turbo Pascal oh, yeah. was my second language and Fortran. And yeah, okay. I'm, I'm an old geek. But um, Pascal was my first, and, uh, and I just remembered that the name of the game was Snipe. Oh, sure, I remember oh, yeah. Snipe. Yeah, I do. You're right, that was fun. Actually, there was a version of that. Uh, Mark will remember this. There was a version of Snipe that was playable on the old bulletin board that we used to use, uh, back in Wisconsin back in the I day. Love it. Yeah, was it PC Exec? What was the exact, name of that? Exec was... PC? Yeah, exec PC. Mark and I were talking last time I was back in Wisconsin. I went and visited him, and uh, he oh, had, he had picked up a bit of a new habit. I'll say habit instead of hobby because we just we don't roll like that. It's not hobbies; it's habits. It still it always reminds me of my uh, my favorite uh, <laughs> album name by the Doobie Brothers. Uh, you know what were vice what were once vices are now habits. Um, but uh, Mark, you're you. you're. You've grown in your uh, appreciation and your uh, your accomplished nature as far as the ukulele goes. Now, ukulele has been a trending uh, instrument for about the past decade and some. And of course, yeah. out here in hipster Oregon, uh, the ukulele is wildly popular. So if you need to bring the band on a road trip, we'll be able to put you in <laughs> venues. I promise you. All right, we'll you. see how it goes. But, I know uh, some of those people out there now, so. Yeah, there you go. And you got a, you got a bed to stay in. But uh, we've got a segment here that we call. Music You Didn't Know You Loved. And I'll admit that my knowledge of the uke as, oh. as an instrument is kind of limited. Uh, I remember Robert and I were both really motivated uh, back when Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam came out with his ukulele album. Back yes. when. He was kind of, I don't know, Robert, would you kind of call that cutting edge for Eddie Vedder back in the day? Untraditional ukulele. And I think that was the thing that lit me up about it. Yeah, I agree. As I've been, I've been playing ukulele for a while as well. Uh, uh, probably not as long as Mark, but um, yeah, it, it was just very untraditional ukulele stylings. And I, and it, it was just, it lit me up. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, get... go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. No, you. So yeah, so I th- I must have gotten into the cult uh, about, about about 15 years ago, and um, and I can tell you how this happened though. It's like this is not a new instrument for me. I was since I was born in Hawaii, um, we had him in the house, and um, uh, my dad was in the service. I was born on old Tripler in in uh, Honolulu, and so we had ukuleles growing up. And I will. Oh, I look here. Oh, would um, you please? Oh, but I will tell you, this is the first song I remember my mother. I'm not going to sing or anything, but I'll give you the gist of it. But this is very old school, right? So um, I hope it's I, I hope it's no no rights, no royalties, old school. Real old school. Okay. <laughs> I gotta say, you stepped up. You stepped it up a little bit from the last time we were together, and we were That's singing. Cool. Yeah, we were, by. we were. We were. We so, were singing um, uh, John Prine's "Illegal Smile" together. But I still sing nothing but John Prine. I'm. I, and and it's amazing how much. 
Yeah, the other cult members in the ukulele universe are all worshipers at the altar, of course, of John Prine. Oh, St. Um, John. But I will tell you, it's like, what happened to me was, and it's like he's wearing, uh, Robert's wearing his Jake Shimabukuro uh, shirt. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. Right on. Right on, okay. Yeah, he, he dressed so for the occasion. About, about he, 15 years ago, um, about 15 years ago, I was making jokes in class about ukuleles. Because that's 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 how I roll. If, if you're going to teach uh, 18 to 25 year olds uh, Plato and make it fun, you better bring your your A game <laughs> or so your ukulele. I usually, <laughs> bring your I ukulele. Usually, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you want it. You want it. You want to roll off the edge a little bit. You know what I'm saying? So I was making jokes about ukuleles, and Plato. So I don't remember what it was. And and one of my students sent me a link to the famous Jake Shimabukuro Central Park yeah. video. You know the one I'm talking about, yep. uh, playing while my guitar gently weeps, which like killed it. Well, oh, geez, yeah, that so, was that that was us stepping out into a different world as far as ukulele got, goes. The one that really got me was not the one that was in Central Park, but the one where he's actually isn't he in a studio? I think he did another one that was he was he was actually on uh, I think he was on a jetty or something like that in Hawaii. Oh uh, yeah, and he did, yeah. Oh right! Yeah. yeah, we'll link. We'll find and link that one down below as well. Yeah, you can put those guys up. Hell if yeah! If you really wanted to see Jake lose it, there, um, he did a TED Talk version uh, where he did Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh uh, yeah. Yes. And if you if you haven't seen that, it's just like killer. Well, okay. So I so I, I open this thing up and I'm thinking, oh cute, another Hawaiian kid playing the ukulele. And then of course it's just like, <laughs> holy cats! But what happened with me though was. It lit up all this latent circuitry in my head from my childhood, right? From like before I, we left when I was two years old. So I have dim memories, but it hit all that, those latent circuits. And it was like, uh, uh. and um, I put it off for about a month and a half. My then fabulous wife um, said, uh, buy the freaking you. So I did. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like. That stuff. So, like, I just played. That's five foot two, right? Every one of those songs essentially has the same chord structure, right? Yeah, boy, and um, they they scolded us punk kids for three chords. Oh yeah, there's, it's all the same chords, and it's like uh, every song runs the same. Um, Ain't misbehaving and uh, right. Paper Moon, for instance, same chord structures, all that. Well, yeah. Okay. Has anybody seen my gal? Yeah. So this is actually fairly amusing. My youth buddies know this stuff because we all know each other now. But but um, uh, I found my way to the easyfolk.com web uh, webpage, which was like the only one around at the time that touched on this because I blew through that first set of strings in, a, in about a month. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what happens to people who play the uke. It's like you just become completely fixated and obsessed. I mean, even guitar players, if you get a new guitar, it's like, you know, that's all you're doing for the next yeah. month. Right. Um, yeah. And so I put a note up. Oh, this is I'll just introduce my my uh, my the rest of my cult members this way. Oh, do. And how I got introduced to them. So I, I put a note up in Easy Folk and I said, hey, I need new strings for this uh, for the and it was a Kala brand tenor, which was a pretty good make. I still have it. Actually, it looks a little bit like Woody, uh, like uh, Willie Nelson's trigger now. Oh, nice. So but. I, I, was, I, I, I thought I thought for sure you were going to go the route of this looks like uh, this ukulele kills fascists. Which, by the way, oh. if you don't have a uke that has that on there, you really should. Yeah. The, the, there's a, I have a friend named Bob Colliday whose uke says this this instrument kills tiny fascists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Bob is one of the great fixtures at the ukulele world. I had this actually. Here's the mug at the uh, at the. At the Ukulele World Congress in uh, Needmore in Nashville, Indiana, every nice. year in June. Nice. It's a Woodstock for ukulele players. Well, so I put this note up in Easy Folk. I said, where can I get new strings? And I got this really weird uh, private message from this guy named Neil Paisley. And Neil says, uh, hey, you're, it looks says here you're in Wisconsin. Where are you? I said, out in West Bend. He goes, oh, so pretty close to Milwaukee. I said, yeah. He goes, and so he says, how would you like to help organize the first Milwaukee ukulele festival? And it was like, I thought, follow the yellow brick road. So <laughs> actually, so I, said, I, re I remember I, and I inadvertently gave you a hand with that because when you were doing that was when I was oh. back in town and I remember you sending me oh. out to the airport with flyers saying, just scatter them as you go. Kind oh, of like did. rose yeah, yeah, petals. Yeah, 
Yeah, uh, you so, know, I gotta I gotta interject for a second. Interesting that you would use that particular phrase, "follow the yellow brick road," given that yeah. oh, one yeah. of the things that really brought the ukulele to the forefront oh, in pop is, consciousness is, is "over the is, rainbow." Yeah, is oh yeah, is is is, is, is his version over of "over the rainbow," which of course um, we'll, we'll put a gratuitous link down there because I, anytime I get to hear it, I I just yeah, I that played at my wedding, which of course. Mark was at. Mark was one of my groomsmen at my wedding. Quite a wedding that was. Yeah, it was. It was good. <laughs> uh, I'm glad. We'll save that for the. We'll I, save that for the. I'll just. Say, I'll just say that um, the wedding is a great memory for me. Yeah, we'll save that for the after dark version <laughs> of this podcast. There you go. The night flight um, version. The night flight version. It was version one of the of most Robert. interesting bachelor bachelorette yeah. parties I've ever been to. I can say that. Okay. Yeah, and well, you know so, what? That's not even what I was remembering. That's how old I've gotten that I don't even remember the strip club section of the show. It was I, so, <laughs> and it was surreal strip club. This was not like normal. This was like surreal uh, fun. It was. So, well, anyway, so I. I wrote back to Neil and I said, what would be involved in this? And he, and Neil wrote back and said, uh, probably Mexican food. <laughs> and so I'm I thought, there. I need to know this guy better. <laughs> so we went down and I went down to the, it was at, uh, and maybe you remember Cielito Lindos, uh, Andy Don, oh, second and national. Hell yeah, Fantastic. I do. Uh, total, total plug here. Best mole oh, in Milwaukee. Oh, without question. Yeah. That, that but, had uh, so, 800 different layers of flavor to it. Uh, uh, we have an awesome Hispanic community uh, here. Well, okay, so um, I go in, I walk in, and sitting at this long table is every folk stereotype in the in the book. It was like a mighty wind that just blown them off <laughs> awesome. and landed them there. And there was the uh, there was the old guy with the gray beard and wearing the two, the uh, wearing the uh, beret. He was there. Awesome. Uh, Stephen was there. Um, there was uh, there was the university professor guy who was there, and then finally down at the end of the table was this guy dressed up like a Yiddish tin pan alley artist from the 1930s, and it, that was Little Rev. That was Mark Revens, his name, and we'll put up links for Rev. Hell yes, we um, will. And Rev is a complete force of nature. He's a uh, he's uh, to to use the parlance of the kids. He's a fucking beast. Oh my I, god, he, he actually you hear that is. Guy yeah, he really is. And, and what's fun about him is he started off, apparently, I'm told, I know people who see it, he'd been a fixture around Milwaukee for years. He was a student here of a guy named Jim Liben, who was one of the great blues uh, Jim Liben and players. Liben's Blues Band. I actually, I actually, I used to know Jim. Yeah, uh, he's still around, man. He's still oh, in wow. great shape. Awesome. Yeah. I'm glad and to he, hear that. He, hey, Jim. So Rev, Rev I, I did sound him. for you a couple times back in the wow. day. So, uh but then Rev got hooked up on this ukulele thing and just uh, took off into the ozone. So it wasn't his, his it wasn't really his about... native instrument. He came to it uh, as a oh, secondary no, a, thing from a player. He was a head banging rocker. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. but uh, he, he migrated over through the blues and stuff. So and it's funny. It's like um, he was just the guy who organized the Milwaukee Ukulele Festival, and he, he helped organize the Milwaukee Ukulele Club, which is a pretty big bunch now. But what what people don't know about Rev is how much he's helped other ukulele players who've made it now into the big time. And um, he's, his generosity just goes on and on. And he lives up in Sheboygan now. So he's, he's on the, you know, when he's not on the road, he's doing concerts online and he's raising his, his uh, daughter with his, his uh, new, his new wife up there in Sheboygan. It's fantastic. And yeah, so, I was, I was going to mention that one of the things that I'd noticed, cause I, I, I'm not a, a, an acolyte, a devotee or really a follower, except for the fact that you keep on saying his name. So I did look into him in the past. And one of the things that I was really impressed with is like a, a number of, of artists. Um, he really took the pandemic as a way to find new ways to connect and find new ways to keep the passion of what he does going. And not only that, yeah. but keep pushing that passion out to other people who are embracing it. And so there's yeah. tons of stuff. Rev is a, uh, is also a force of nature on YouTube. Jake does, or like one of my other good friends is this. I'll tell you, I, I, as I was learning 
in ukulele, I saw uh, uh, lead, lead kapa'ano. Mm. That really, I mean, you want to talk about somebody that's just incredible. Um, yeah. Yeah, anytime somebody does something on an instrument where it makes you go, I didn't know you could do that on an instrument. Exactly. Yeah. And this is this guy is one of the this guy is one of the the uh he's he's one of the the the, the legends. He's the guy that teaches everybody else, right? Uh uh and I took I took a YouTube of that to my instructor and I said, I want to learn how to do this. And he looked at it and he looked at it again and he looked at it again. And he went, yeah, no. no. <laughs> well, yeah, that, no. that that reminds me of one of my favorite no. one of my favorite jokes about um, uh, comedian Billy Connolly. A lot of people don't know that Billy Connolly is a, a very accomplished banjo mm -hmm. player. Uh, oh and, no, I didn't know. Yeah, that and the, and the problem you had, Robert, yeah. is what happened here with Billy Connolly uh, back in the in the late '60s. He was going to his uh, ukulele lesson, or excuse me, his banjo lesson in Glasgow, and uh, his his banjo teacher was gone. And um, he hunted him down and the, he said, why won't you teach me anymore? I was just getting good. And the guy was just like, I, I, I don't know. You're, you're, you're the, you're the teacher now. And he's like, I can't teach. You're the teacher. And he's like, look, the only reason why I'm your damn teacher is because I'm two pages ahead of you in the Pete Seeger, how to play the banjo book. <laughs> but uh, right. yeah, so I tell you what we're gonna do. Yeah, we're that, gonna put. That I think not Jay, and then, and then uh, uh, this Rev guy though, he's really good. Yeah, he is really, really good. good, and we're gonna have all sorts of good links down there. Uh, and again, uh, preemptive thanks because we haven't talked to him yet, but Mark's a friend, so we're gonna do this. Uh, thanks a lot, Rev, for letting us uh, feature some of your material here in our podcast. Uh, but uh, that's pretty much what we got for you here today on Keep Your Hat On, folks. Um, again, please do us a favor, like, click, subscribe. Uh, if you feel like kicking us a few bucks to keep these uh, these LED lights on, uh, you can always uh, visit, visit us on our Patreon page. Um, but until next time, do us a favor. For Chris, Robert, Mark, and myself, keep your hat on. We may end up miles from here. Thanks a lot, folks. We'll talk to you again in a couple weeks. Stay safe, wear your mask, get your shot, and we'll see you again really soon. Bye-bye. Well, there's a chunk of time you can't get back. From Portland, Oregon, this has been Keep Your Hat On, a big little show about a whole lot of nothing in particular. Keep Your Hat On is a narrow band broadcast network production in association with PodSquadPDX.com. Andrew Scott, executive producer. Robert Anthony and Chris Vacano, associate producers. Our theme music was written and produced by Andrew Scott, along with help from Ron Kajawa. Website design and maintenance by Vacano Creative, Chris Vacano Webmaster, available at VacanoCreative.com. Audio and video production by Andrew Scott, available at andrewscottmedia.com. Got ideas or comments for the show? Email us at talkback at kyhopodcast.com. And don't forget to like, click, and subscribe. On behalf of the boys, I'm your announcer, Michael Brumage. Thanks for listening. Uh, I guess. This is Keep Your Hat on the show where we don't know even we're I'm going to do that again. Please. And that's why the Howleys get the blues. <laughs> NBBN. The Narrow Band Broadcast Network. The focus is on you.